the practical Jesus, where do you go when you die? Where do you go when you die? Uh, there was a sick man, and he turned to his doctor. He, it, was, it was many years ago, and, and the doctor had a bedroom in his home where the man was sick. It was his office, and he was dying. And he said, Doctor, I, I know you're a Christian, and I'm afraid. I'm afraid of what's going to happen. What's going to happen to me when, when I die? And the doctor looked at him and said, I don't know. He said, what do you mean you don't know? I thought you were a Christian. I thought you understand all that. What's heaven going to be like? Where, where, where is it all going to end? And he said, I don't know. He said, I'm, I'm a Christian, but I don't have all the answers. I don't have the, the answer to that. I just know that I, I believe in Jesus. And as he touched the doorknob and he turned the, he turned the doorknob of, of the bedroom, up jumped his little dog. And it jumped into his arms. And, and he turned back to the man and he said, I think it's an awful lot like that. You see, I don't know what's on the other side of the door from death. But what I do know, it's going to be just like my little dog. I'm going to be the little dog, and I'm going to be glad to see my master. I'm just going to be glad to see my master. Because wherever Jesus is, that's where I want to be. Wherever Jesus is, that's where I want to be. And that's such a a comforting word to our lives. Aren't you glad you don't have to steer or navigate or drive or get an airplane ticket or a, or a rocket ship ride to get to heaven after you pass off this earth? That you're just going to go. Turn, if you will, to 2 Corinthians in the fourth chapter. Flip through the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, find Acts, then Romans, and then you'll bump into the Corinthians. And it's Corinthians number 2, 2 Corinthians 4. Now, we have treasures. We have treasures in jars. That's what a lot of your your Bible subtopic headings will say. It will say something like that, earthen jars, clay jars. Now, we have treasures in clay jars so that this extraordinary power may be from God and not from us. We are pressured in every way but not crushed. We are perplexed but not despair. We are persecuted but not abandoned. We are struck down but not destroyed. We always carry the death of Jesus in our body so that the life of Jesus also may be revealed in our body. For we who live are always given over to death because of Jesus so that Jesus' life may be also revealed in our mortal flesh. So death works in us but life in you. And since we have the same spirit of faith in accordance with what is written, I believe, therefore, I spoke. We also believe, and therefore we speak, knowing that the one who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and present you for all of this because of you, so that grace extended more and more people may cause to have thanksgiving to overflow to God in glory. Therefore, we do not give up, even though our outer person is being destroyed, our inner person is being renewed day by day. For our momentary affliction is producing for us an absolute, incomparable, eternal weight of glory. So, we do not focus on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Amen. Now, that's an awful lot of uh, stuff there. We could spend a long time doing an in-depth Bible study on those verses, and I understand that. Because you, you, you read that, and you go, what is Paul trying to say? Paul is trying to say that when we accept Jesus Christ, part of us dies with him. We die with him. Our old nature dies. We are buried with Christ in baptism, but we are resurrected to a new life. The newer part of us lives eternally, but the old part of us wants to focus on right now. 
It wants to focus on the affliction. It wants to focus on the difficulty. It wants to focus on the cancer, on the joblessness, on the death, on the politics, on all those things that cause worry and problem in our life. And Paul is saying that's easy to do. That's easy to do. That's simple to do. Anybody can do that. But if you're a Christian and Christ is alive in you, then refocus on what is important, and what is important is eternal matters, things that are everlasting. Okay, I have a question. You know, if, if you go to invest money for your retirement, you put a dollar in for your retirement, do you go the next day and take it back out? No. You invest the money and you hope that it grows, and someday you'll have it there when you need it. Well, eternal things are worth investing in and being patient about. Because they will grow. They will grow. Paul writes and he says, Jesus Christ is the first fruits of the resurrection. He is the firstborn of the dead. He is the first resurrected. And he said, because he was resurrected, we can be resurrected too. We are resurrected because Jesus Christ has a right. Because he laid down his life and he took his life back up. And he has a right to carry his children with him. Okay. So the question is, where do we go when we die? Every person from the beginning of time, from the beginning of antiquity, have puzzled on that question. I want you to consider something. I want you to consider why the pyramids were built. The pyramids were built as graves for kings so that they could be ushered into their new kingdom. That was the purpose of it. All of recorded history, all mankind has asked that question. You are not unique. Where do I go when I die? What happens to me when I die? When I pass off this earth, what happens? In fact, it's pretty scary. Some people are very scared by it. Uh, Charles Spurgeon, at his conversion, he said, the only thing I could focus on was the fact that my eternal soul was going to hell. That's all I could think about that wintry night when he dashed into this little church, this little primitive Baptist church. He dashed into it. There was a congregation a third of this size in there. The preacher's unknown. We have no idea who it is. But he preached a simple message of salvation. And at that moment, Charles Spurgeon invited Jesus Christ to become his Lord and Savior, a great Baptist pastor of many, many years ago. But that seems to have been watered down. That seems to have been something that has begun to escape this generation, the idea of an eternal hell, of a place where we are separated from life, separated from Christ, separated from everything except darkness and pain. That's not much of a future. That's not much of something to hope into. Well, so where do we go when we die? Corinthians says this, 2 Corinthians and 5.8. We, Paul writes, and he says, we are of good courage, I say, and I willing rather to be absent from the body is to be home with the Lord. Be absent from the body is to be home with the, with the Lord. And so that there's no room for doubt in Philippians 1.23, Paul writes, he says, I am hard pressed from both directions and I have a desire to depart and be with Christ. I have a desire to depart and be with Christ. He's saying I'm being shoved from both directions. And he's explaining to the Corinthians, he says to be absent from your body, to die, is to be present with the Lord. So let's do a little backwards engineering. Let's look at what this says. Uh, very, very clearly, it repeats it over and over again in the Scriptures. It says that Jesus Christ ascended into heaven and he sat down at the right hand of the Father. Sat down at the right hand of the Father in the glory of the kingdom of heaven. When John sees the great revelation that he was given, the Lamb of God is standing in the midst of heaven. So let's back engineer this. Paul writes, he says, to be absent. Absent from the body is to be home with the Lord. So where is Jesus? He's in heaven. He's in heaven. So when you die, you are with Jesus, and Jesus is in heaven, period. Holy Spirit's with us. The transcendent being of Christ is with us. The very Spirit of Christ is with us. As Christians, if you're not a Christian, He's not with you. That's the way that works. You're either in the family or you're the out of the family. It's, it's a simple process. Now, let's keep moving. 
So then we have all sorts of alternative questions. Well, what about somebody who commits suicide? Isn't that the unpardonable sin? Suicide is a horrible thing. It's an awful thing. It's an incredibly thing. Whenever any, I ever hear somebody talk about that in counselor training, JT would tell you, Angela would tell you, and all of our other faithful counselors here in this church would tell you, Wally would tell you, they would say to you, I take that very seriously. When somebody starts talking about that, that's something we take very seriously. That's not a, not a light conversation. That is a one where you look at somebody and you go, well, tell me a little more about it. I need to understand what you mean by that. Because every one of us has said, I just feel like dying. Okay, that was so embarrassing. I could just kill them. You know, how many of you have ever said that about your kids? I'd really like to kill them now. Okay, you know, you know, I, I've kind of modified that. I try to trade them in at places. I offer them for like, you know, food and stuff. But, you know, it doesn't work out so well. They look at them and go, no. Um, you know, it's just a, just a general rejection. So I, I, do believe, I do believe that we've all talked about it. Every person on earth, every person on earth, every person on earth has thought about suicide at one point in time or another. Every single person. That's actually healthy. That's actually healthy because it proves to you how selfish you are. Okay, it's just real simple. You think about it, and you go, it'd be better to, and you think, and the main reason you think about it is because you say things like this, well, they'd be really sorry when I'm gone. They'd really miss me. They'd all be there crying. They'd feel bad about me being gone. And then you think about, huh, well, but if I'm gone, then I can't even see them cry. That's not any good. I'll just go make them cry. I'll fix that. I, you know, I, a, lot of, a lot of men in my family have died very young, and mostly because they drank two-fifths of whiskey a day and smoked two packs of cigarettes. And so fortunately, I don't have that affliction anymore, and maybe I'll make it beyond. Well, the kids and I were talking the other day, and I said, look, I've decided I'm going to live to 120 and bury all of you. And I'll, that's my way.